I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Aliens. Are we alone in the universe? If not, then what would these aliens look like? What would they be like? Would they try to enslave us? Would they try to be our friends? Would they be so different from us that trying to understand them would be nearly impossible? Science fiction has been asking these questions for decades, and there have been many portrayals of these creatures from outer space. But one interpretation still stands out in my mind decades later. It was a show that had such a unique take on aliens that we would not see it repeated for another 20 years. It's not very often that a cancelled TV show would have such a massive effect on this genre, but Alien Nation was such a show. Based on the cult film of the same name, the Alien Nation series took one scene out of this movie and spun sci-fi gold out of it. Sadly, the show may have fallen into obscurity and only a few passionate fans still keep its legacy alive. So of course, that makes it the perfect show to cover in this episode of Gone, but not forgotten. Thanks for watching Gone But Not Forgotten. If you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. Now, back to the show. In 1988, Alien Nation hit theaters, a movie that revolved around two cops, one alien, and one human trying to solve a murder. It was a fun flick, very film noir, and with excellent performances from James Caan and Mandy Patinkin. The film was a moderate hit that did fairly well with critics, and its concept was appealing enough to make it into a television series. It was decided that the Alien Nation show would be like Lethal Weapon, but with aliens and the network needed a creative showrunner for the show. They needed someone who had experience in science fiction and an excellent track record in making hit TV shows. Enter Kenneth Johnson, the man behind such classic series as The Bionic Woman, The Incredible Hulk, and the groundbreaking sci-fi miniseries, V. Johnson was told they wanted an adaptation of the Alien Nation movie for television, but after he watched the movie, Johnson had only three things to say. This is stupid. He shared the same opinion of the movie as famed movie critics Siskel and Ebert, that it was just a buddy cop film, but with an alien. It was a fish out of water tale with a sci-fi twist. However, there was one scene in this film that Johnson found appealing. It was the scene where James Conn's cop picks up Manny Patinkin's alien from work. It only runs a few seconds long, but the scene had a huge impact on Johnson, who began to think, what were the lives of these aliens out in the real world? And so the Alien Nation show revolves around a spaceship that crashes in the desert full of alien refugees. The Tank Denise, or newcomers as they are now called, as the newly arrived aliens have become the new minority of the world. The show focuses on the struggles of racism, bigotry, and xenophobia that they now face, as the newcomers are victims of a racist group called the Purist who are violent towards the newcomers. At the same time, they're discriminated against in other ways, such as not letting their children be integrated into school or not welcomed into their neighborhoods. We see this as the show revolves around our main characters, Detective Matthew Matt Sykes, played by Gary Graham, and Detective George Francisco, played by Eric Pierpoint. At first, Matt does not like his partner. He's still coming to terms with the death of his previous partner at the hands of newcomer criminals. But he eventually comes around when he sees the racism against his partner's daughter at the hands of a group of bigots. I really love this moment where he puts the mob in its place. Why stop with running them back to Slagtown? Why don't we just kill them? Teach them a lesson! Keep them in their place! Keep America pure! Yeah! Yeah! We need to paint little stars on them to recognize them, do we? Hell, that'll be easy to round up. Look at them. This will be a piece of cake. And enough of us get together, it'll almost seem legal, won't it? Put little white pointy sheets on our heads and hang us a few slags, huh? It seems like that which elevate the show to another level. Kenneth Johnson was originally told by the network that they wanted an alien lethal weapon but he convinced them to make it more like an alien in the heat of the night. 
with the show focusing more on character relationships, with the action being more in the background. Graham played the part of Sykes as a man who's still adjusting to being around a new culture that he does not understand. But he grew to be attached to not only his partner and his family, but his recurring love interest, Kathy Frankel, played by Terry Trius. The chemistry between Graham and Trius was amazing. The will-they-won't-they they aspect of this show was one of my favorite storylines throughout the series. Kathy was a biochemist who assisted Sykes and Francisco on their cases. She was also the most down-to-earth and patient character in this series. Sykes could be a real dumbass, and Kathy would be the one to educate him, with the relationship growing between them as a result. Sykes' partner was newcomer detective George Francisco. His name was actually Sam, but Sykes told him the name Sam Francisco was the stupidest name he had ever heard. So he told him his new name was George, and it happened to stick. George was played by Eric Pierpoint, an amazing actor who is still thankfully working today. He played George as a kind and noble soul, who would always follow the rules and kept his patience while Sykes was being an ass. But Francisco could sometimes be a bit clumsy when it came to social interactions with humans. It was whenever he got pissed off that shit got real. Still, Sykes and George's relationship grew over time, and I was very impressed at how slowly this bond grew throughout the series. Most of the time, and especially at that time on television, the relationships between characters were incredibly rushed. Some of my favorite scenes that involved George was when he would become overconfident and think that he had everything figured out about human society. That IRS wanted to assess me $2,400 in penalties. You put your foot down at the IRS? Matt, you have such a great country. You're free to stand up to your government and just say no. What'd you do? Well, I told them I wouldn't pay. Oh, what a feeling it is for a former slave to look authority in the eye and say, I know my rights. Call him up. Tell him you're sorry. Tell him you'll pay. What? That was general accounting. That IRS is attaching my paycheck. I can't have it. Call him up. Gravel. But I think my favorite character of the cast was George's wife, Susan. Many of the most powerful scenes in the show involved her dealing with newcomer discrimination firsthand. The most powerful scene of the pilot episode involves Susan, as she becomes frustrated with the amount of harassment her daughter Emily is encountering at school. She decides to take Emily out of school, but while she's in the bathroom, a woman takes Susan aside and tells her the story of an old lady who caused controversy in her town by drinking from a whites-only fountain. She told Susan that sometimes you have to fight racism however you can, that sometimes you have to just drink the water. It was a powerful scene that perfectly showed how amazing this show was. Susan was played by the amazing Michelle Scarabelli. Michelle played Susan as a strong mother and was one of the windows to the day-to-day -day life of what newcomers experienced on Earth. Funny story, during the audition process, Scarabelli actually had to hum. This was because in the series, one of the way newcomers had foreplay was humming on their backs while in bed. Man, that is one weird casting couch story. George and Susan's kids were Emily, played by Lauren Woodland, and Buck, played by Sean Six. I have to say that Emily was probably one of the sweetest kids on television that I had ever seen. It was obvious that she would be the one to turn Sykes away from hatred. Buck, on the other hand, was a pain in the ass. He was always whining or getting into trouble. He had no love for humans, although he would eventually soften up on newcomer and human relations. But his character was written poorly for a lot of the series. The makeup of the Alien Nation series was created by Rick Stratton, a veteran in the makeup design film industry. He started out working on Star Trek The Motion Picture and was involved in the new design for the Klingons. He met and developed a friendship with Johnson on the first V miniseries. His work on the show is amazing, the best example being in the 17th episode called Real Men. 
In the episode, George gives birth to a daughter, himself. The birth effect was impressive, although it did gross out Gary Graham. Some of the cast, such as Michelle Scarabelli and Terry Trius, were not big fans of this makeup process. They said the makeup was so hot that when they took off the bald cap on their head, there would be a river of sweat. Lauren Woodland had to have multiple headpieces made since she started to grow up on the series. Funny tidbit for you, when some of the actors saw the movie Galaxy Quest, they laughed their asses off because they knew what a pain in the ass it must have been for Alan Rickman to wear that headpiece. Next. Johnson said he was particularly impressed by Eric Pierpoint because he did not have an issue acting even though his hearing was impaired. You see, one of the aspects of the makeup was that the newcomers did not have ears, just little slots where their ears should be. This section of the makeup would be placed over the ears of the actors, which would make it hard to hear. Now, the scripts on the show were incredible. Some of my favorite episodes tend to explore the newcomer society, like learning how newcomers procreate or seeing the different religions of the Tanktonese. But then there were darker aspects that involved the evil overseers who had enslaved the newcomers. The overseers were one of the main villains of the series. One episode of the show that illustrated their cruelty was the excellent episode called The Game, where it's revealed that George and his brother were forced into a game of Russian roulette for the amusement of the overseers. The show would end up gaining a strong following, and even though the network put them up against football, the ratings were still good. But the head of the network just didn't understand the show. Should I make you folks guess what network was responsible for canceling the show? Is it A, QVC, B, PBS, or C, Fox? If you guessed Fox, then no fucking shit! You know, maybe I should make up some t-shirts that say that a dung beetle is smarter than the executives in charge of the original programming at the Fox Network. Anyway, the man in charge of original programming at the time was Barry Diller, who decided that he should cancel any show that was not a comedy. He felt that comedies would make the Fox Network's ratings soar. And a year later, the comedies tanked so bad that Fox had nothing to air on Monday night. Kenneth Johnson was insulted, and Fox executive Peter Chernin felt the same way, and at the Television Critics Association, publicly apologized for canceling Alien Nation, saying that it was one of the biggest mistakes that they had ever made. Well, at least someone admitted it. After a few years of Kenneth Johnson pestering the network, he was finally given the green light to make a TV movie wrapping up the cliffhanger of the series. This movie proved to be such a hit that four more TV movies were ordered. And since those movies last aired, the fan base of Alien Nation is still strong. Many novels and comics have been made about the series. And if you're interested in watching it for yourself, it is available on the free streaming service, Tubi. The only problem that I have encountered, though, is in finding the TV movies. In 2007, there was a DVD release with all of these films, but that has since gone out of print. If you folks can get your hands on them, then I highly recommend. Alien Nation was a show that resonated with the public. One of the best stories about its fans that I ever heard was from Eric Pierpoint. After the show was canceled, he was performing in a play in New York City. And while taking the subway home, he was approached by a black woman. She asked him if he was the actor who played George on Alien Nation. He said yes, and the woman turned to the all-minority-filled subway car and pointed out who Eric Pierpoint was. Pierpoint said he missed his stop multiple times because everyone in the car had to tell him how much this show meant to them. He said that many of the people on the train talked about how much they identified with the newcomers, that they felt that their experience as minorities were being talked about in a whole new way. Now, should this show come back? Hell yeah. There is so much more that they could explore. I would love to see different aspects of the newcomer society. I'd love to see more of the way our society is interpreted by the newcomers. Over the years, there has been much talk of doing a remake, and hopefully this will become a reality one day. But in the meantime, why don't you guys sit back and enjoy this show for yourselves? Hey, if it takes a cone-headed alien to make you learn about how bigotry and xenophobia are wrong, 
then I'd say that crash spaceship was all worth it. Five little men in a flying saucer flew around the earth one day. They looked left and right, but they didn't like the sight, so one man flew away. I'm Jesse Shade speaking on behalf of Dave Arroyo for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Originals channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support, and we will see you next time for the next episode of Gone, but not forgotten.